Why is it so hard to play old games? I really wanted to play SimCity 2000, arguably the definitive city builder simulator, but being released all the way back in 1993 would even work on a Windows 11 PC. First things first, I need to acquire the game. Good Old Games has it for sale, however according to at least two comments it's the inferior DOS version run through an emulator. Also, according to strangers on the internet, I want the Windows 95 vintage for the best reticulating splines experience. Actually tracking down this version was harder than I thought. I could look to try and find an original CD version, but my PC doesn't even have a CD drive. Bouncing around various abandonware sites of dubious origin, I eventually found it on archive.org. Seeing as one commenter had a less than ideal experience, I decided to spin up a Windows 11 VM to try it out. So the obvious first step is to install the game. But alas, I was a fool to think that something called setup would actually do any setup. Turns out, this installer is not a modern Windows executable, but a 16-bit file format that was only supported up until Windows 2000. On the most basic level, all an installer does is just copy files to the right place on your hard drive, so all the game files must exist in the download somewhere. Ok, so I found a file called simcity.exe, and I'll execute anything once, so let's give it a go. So I think that the game itself somehow knows whether it's been installed correctly or not. But how? If we can figure that out, then maybe we can recreate the installation steps that our poor deprecated setup XE can no longer do. I've opened the game up in the debugger, in this case x64 debug, and this will allow us to inspect the program as it's running. So I've set a breakpoint on the function message box, which means the program will pause when a message box is about to be created. Ok, so we've broken on the message box create. So I've taken the address of the function which creates the message box and I've opened it up in Ghidra which is a decompiler and disassembler. Basically it shows me the assembly of the program here and a heuristic approximation of C code that represents that assembly here. So I've traced this back up the call stack and we've arrived at this if else statement here and basically if local 18 is 0 then the message box is created. Now here we can see the classic issue with this heuristic decompilation. It's fabricated this local 18 variable. Ghidra knows that the variable is on the stack, so it's created this local variable, but it doesn't appear to be set anywhere. We could trace through all the assembly to try and find out where this local 18 variable is set. However, the easiest thing to do is just to jump back into the debugger and inspect it whilst it's running. So using a hardware breakpoint, we can get the debugger to stop when the memory address is written to. So playing around a bit with the hardware breakpoints and Ghidra, we eventually end up here, which is what's initialising that variable to zero, but it's still not clear where it's being set. Can't really get much further with hardware breakpoints now, as they can't break when a value isn't set. Basically, this variable is initialised to zero, and somewhere there's code that makes it non-zero, however, it's never being executed, so there's no way we can get a debugger to ever get to it and pause. As is often the case, sometimes you just need to take a step back and reassess your plan of attack. So looking just above this if statement, there's a function that takes two strings, registration and mayor name. And inside this function, it does a load of registry gubbins. The registry is a unique feature for Windows that is a global database that allows the operating system and applications to store arbitrary data. Most commonly it's used for configuration and settings data. Using a tool called Procmon, we can see all the registry calls the game makes and it's trying to load this key but it's not found. So let's create it. Windows ships with regedit which allows you to view and edit the registry, so let's create this key. Oh nice, it loads my name. Now looking back at the code, that mysterious local 18 variable was actually the length of the string that we put into that registry key. Now on to the next problem. Error opening file backslash backslash data usa dot dat. So looking back at Procmon we can see that it tries to load a path called data from the registry and then tries to open a file. So presumably it's going to prepend the registry key value to this file name, which in this case is empty as it doesn't exist. So let's add this key to the data directory in the install file which does contain this file. Ok, nice, a new menu. I feel like we're getting somewhere now, so let's try starting a new game. Something seems off. 
I'm no graphic designer, but I'm pretty sure these aren't the intended colors. So I've tried messing around with the compatibility mode in Windows, but to no avail. I also downloaded the SC2K Repainter program as I read online that it can fix some of the graphical issues with the game. This just gave me a headache. I spent some time fruitlessly trying to solve this issue, but then I remembered how I solved the previous issue I'd had, with the registry. I've looked for other registry keys the program is trying and failing to open, and I found this one called Graphics, also in the Paths subdirectory. So looking for this string in the binary, we can see that the function that loads it also further down loads the string palmuster.bump. Seeing as this file also exists in the bitmap directory in the install files, let's try setting the graphics registry key to be this path. Hey, new graphics. Ah, now we have much less migraine inducing colors. After playing for a bit, a new problem arose. We cannot save. In fact, both saving and loading outright crashes the game. So I've attached a debugger and tried to load, and I can see that we get a null pointer dereference. And looking at this in Ghidra, it looks like it's trying to call a function which is an offset from some local variable. This is annoying as it means we cannot figure out what function it's trying to call just by looking at the disassembly, as we don't know what this value is until it runs, but when it does run, it's zero due to some bug or issue. We can look at the call stack for this function, but it looks like it's just called from nowhere. Now, a bit of Windows guesswork here, but a function which is seemingly called from nowhere and has these arguments is normally some sort of message handler. So we know that EAX is our offending null pointer, and looking in Ghidra, we can see that it should be set from this function. So this function should return us a pointer, and on the other end of that pointer, specifically OX74 bytes in, should be the address of a callable function, but it's returning zero. This function is passed a handle to the current window, which we know by following the arguments from the original handler, and it then passes this to cmap pointer to pointer lookup. Now I've never heard of this, but apparently it's part of MFC, the Microsoft Foundation class library, which provides an object oriented wrapper around much of the Win32 API. So according to the docs, this class is a lookup table, which maps void pointers to void pointers, and also from the docs, it returns zero if the key was not found during a lookup. So presumably, some code, somewhere, should be inserting some data into this lookup with the window handle as a key. This CMAP pointer to pointer class supports two ways of inserting data, set at and the square bracket operator. However, these set operations aren't actually called anywhere in SimCity. There is this undocumented get asoc at, which looks like it could be used to get and set values. So I've spent some time looking at all the call sites for this undocumented function, seeing if anyone anywhere is trying to set some data with the window handle as a key, but I can't see anything obvious. So the next step is trying to find out what is sending this original message, which like I said earlier, isn't easy. So ideally we just want to inspect all the messages that this application is sending whilst it's running. So I'm going to use a tool called Spy++, which is actually a Microsoft tool which ships with Visual Studio. So it looks like there's some messages with unknown IDs being sent around the time of the crash, so maybe these are some sort of custom message, but I just cannot find these calls in Ghidra anywhere. As always, we need to take a step back and reassess our approach. Maybe we can find the code that fires when we click the load game button. Looking for the string in the load game button, we can see that the menu is loaded from a resource, which is a Windows mechanism for embedding data directly into an executable. In fact, using a tool called CFF Explorer, we can see all the menus directly stored in the exe file. So I've searched for the function which loads menu items from resources, and we can see it passes our crashing function as a handler. So my original assumption was slightly wrong. Our crashing function doesn't come from a message handler, but a dialogue handler. Thanks Windows for giving these very similar arguments. Anyway, I wanted to see what is actually supposed to happen when you load and save a game. So I watched a lot of Let's Plays of SimCity 2000. 
Not only did I not find a single recording of someone actually loading and saving the game, I realised just how terrible I was at the game. So let's just assume that, as this is an old Windows game, it uses the functions get save file name and get open file name, which are Win32 functions for creating the save and open file dialogues. So these functions are not only used in SimCity, they are actually both called from the same function. So I've set a breakpoint and this function is definitely called when we click load. So there's loads of arguments for get open file name, however the most interesting one is the flags x. This allows the programmer to customise certain features of the dialog. They're specified as a bit field, however if we decode them we can see that, amongst others, often enable hook and often explorer are set. Now, looking at the docs, these both assume that the lupin fuck argument is set, which it isn't. So this could certainly lead to a null pointer dereference. We can use the debugger to hot patch out those flags. And it works. But we want to make this persistent. I don't want to have to bust out a debugger every time I want to save the game. So we could track down where those flags are set, but seeing as both the open and save dialog are created from the same function, it makes sense just to patch it. Conveniently, there's an unused section just above the function, and this is affectionately known as a code cave. It's somewhere where we can poke a small amount of custom code. So what I've done is written a small amount of assembly which patches the flags, calls the Windows open dialog, and then jumps back into the original function. In the function itself, I've replaced the Win32 function call with a jump to our patched code. So in essence, we still call the Win32 function, however we go via our custom code which strips out the offending flags. And it all just works. That is a lot of effort to get the game working. However, the low level fun doesn't end here. If you want to see how I break down how every Doom game does its rendering, then check out this next video.